Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about overcoming preconceived notions um, in order to have family history success. Now I am still at the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy, which is a week-long intensive course. Um, it's all day every day and you pick a track and you stick with it. Um, there are classes being taught here about New York records and Southern research and land records. Um, the, the class that I'm in is called advanced genealogical methods. Uh, you, you're with the same group of 30 or 40 students and um, the same instructor who usually for one uh, hour or so a day will invite a guest presenter to come in and we're in this class all day every day and then we usually have homework at night and um, I have learned so much it's been three days so far and there's two more to go and um, and it, I'm excited to share with you some of the things that I've been learning in the weeks and months to come. And so um, today, that what that means is that today's presentation is pre-recorded. It's um, the early morning hours here in Salt Lake and um, you'll probably see my red bloodshot eyes. I only had two hours of sleep last night. Um, you get a couple hundred genealogists together in a hotel and um, things get kind of crazy. Um, lots of um, ideas and research to be done. The largest family history library is just a block away from where we are and it was open until nine o'clock last night and and then um, we had the opportunity. I got together with a couple of other genealogists last night. They had um, just spent the evening hours researching um, an adoptee's biological family and they wanted me to review the research that they had done to determine if this was in fact the, the biological family before they presented that information to the adoptee. And so I spent a couple of hours with them last night doing that and then we spent a couple of more hours um, actually identifying living um, cousins from this biological family so that they can contact some of these living cousins and, and connect her with them. And so that was really exciting and rewarding to be able to do that. Um, but then I came back to my room and had a few hours, a couple hours of homework to do and so um, I'm running on a little sleep, um, but I'm really excited about the, the topic today, this idea of preconceived notions, and it, and it goes right along with a couple of the things that I have um, been learning and also a couple of the things that I've been working on. Hopefully it will uh, make sense to you as it relates to some of the things you've been working on as well. So long introduction, I know, but let's go ahead and dive in. Let's just talk about first this word preconceived, overcoming preconceived notions. I actually looked it up. Um, I'm not, a, well, I love words and the way that language works, and so I'm always looking things up. Um, but the word preconceived basically means an idea or opinion formed before having the evidence for its truth or usefulness. So many of you know that I spend um, quite a bit of time on the Ancestry.com Facebook page and in the Ancestry.com Facebook group. Um, I try to keep up or at least pay attention to the chatter, the questions that you're asking each other, um, how you're helping each other out, what kinds of um, roadblocks you're running into with your research. And um, one of the gentlemen that I um, saw on Facebook the other day uh, made a comment and all of a sudden it changed the way that I thought about um, some of the answers that we give to each other. He said um, that somebody had come and looked at his tree online and then sent him a message and the question that they asked was, what is your documentation for this information in your tree? And this guy responded, I don't know what that means, can you help me understand? So this guy was brand new to family history had come online, had put in what he knew about his family into his family tree, had started following those shaky leaves, and we love that. We love that new people are coming into this every day. We love that you're getting so excited about finding and discovering your family history. But there comes a point at which um, you uh, have to know where that information is coming from. You have to be able to have enough information that you can form an opinion, right, um, with evidence so that you know that what you're looking at is true. And that is kind of the definition of documentation. If you just take this idea and change this one word to after instead of before, um, now what you're talking about is documentation or proof for your family tree. And he didn't understand that concept and unfortunately whoever it was that had messaged him did not reply back to help him. And so this guy came to the Facebook page and was asking questions about how he, um, what, you know, what kind of documentation he needed. 
And so that reminded me of a conversation that I had on our Facebook page a couple of months ago, which is where this topic came from. Um, where a woman was asking questions about her family history. She was actually looking for help on our Facebook page about how to find more information out about her family. And the question that was asked to her was, well, how do you know that that information is true? And she didn't know how to answer that question. Um, and there was some back and forth and finally she said well um, this information came from my grandmother and then some more conversation ensued and she um, she got really offended because she thought we were calling her grandmother a liar <laughs> and we weren't <laughs> um, sometimes we have to qu actually all the time we have to question uh, where that information came from so just because your grandmother said that um, your family was Native American or just because um, you saw a document once that listed your great grandfather's birthplace as France or just because you, know, you saw a census <clears throat> from 1870 that listed a bunch of children in a household doesn't mean all of those children are the children of the couple at the beginning of the household. So a lot of times we take one little piece of evidence or one little, one little statement or one document and we try to build an entire family tree on it. And what we end up doing is we end up creating brick walls for ourselves. We end up creating research blocks that then we're not sure how to get around. Or even worse than that, we end up climbing someone else's family tree. We just take the first record that matches this preconceived notion that we have um, and we attach that record or that document or that person to our tree and off we go thinking we've done the right thing. And so what I'm going to just share with you um, kind of briefly but it, um, is the process that I go through and sometimes I go through this process very formally and written down and sometimes I go through this process fairly informally. It doesn't matter how you choose to do it and like like me, you may choose to do it different ways, different times based on the seriousness of the challenge that you're working on or whatever. So my first advice to you is to question everything. Um, my grandmother's name my grandmother's name is Jessie Kerr. Um, well, um, that's what I think I know. <laughs> right? I should, probably should have put that little word in there. What do you think you know? Um, that's what I think I know. Then the next question, of course, is how do you know that? Right? Um, well, I know that's my grandmother's name because I knew my grandmother and she told me that was her name. Well, how did she know that was her name? Well, she knew that was her name because she'd been told that was her name. Well, is there any documentation of that? Is there a birth certificate, a death certificate, a social security um, application? Is there a tombstone, an obituary, a family Bible? Are there other witnesses to the fact that that's her name and this is how old she was when she died and this is where she was born, right? That's what we mean when we talk about documentation. Can you document what you know, which we're all really good about, filling in the, the information in our tree, right? But then how do you know that information? And keep in mind that one single piece of evidence is rarely, I would even say never, sufficient. Um, collect, not just, and you know, some people will say, oh, well, you need at least three pieces of evidence for, no, right? Collect everything you can about an ancestor. What you're going to discover is that Sometimes their names are spelled differently. Sometimes their ages vary. Sometimes their birthplaces vary. You may collect a whole series of records and it may not all agree perfectly. But the more information you collect, the more sources you consult, the more likely you are to get as close to the truth as possible and the more likely you are to identify those people correctly. Um, and that is a really important key for this next step, which is learn to ask good research questions. Now, um, I posed some of these on our Facebook group the other night just to kind of get a feel for um, how you understood this and 
and I wanted to make sure that I was teaching it clearly. When I say ask good research questions, what I'm talking about is asking yourself good research questions. Now, there of course will be times when you question others, and I would hope that if you have older family members still living, parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, um, older cousins, whatever, if you have anybody in a generation, or even if you're lucky enough to have two generations of people older than you, ask them questions. Go interview them, talk to them about their lives, find out what they know. Um, absolutely do that. Um, and that is so important because once they're gone, that information goes with them. So yes, asking other people good questions is important, but that is not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about here is when you are doing your family history research, what questions are you, what, what is it that you're trying to discover? What is it that you're trying to learn? That information comes from um, the questions that you're asking yourself. So the, the information you put in your tree is an answer. What was the question? And sometimes we don't even do that consciously. Sometimes we don't ask ourselves any questions. I want you to ask yourself questions. I also want you to ask yourself good questions. And so good questions um, actually come from two, uh, um, two ideas. And I got these from Dr. Tom Jones, Thomas Jones, who's teaching the class that I'm taking right now. Um, he just put it in a much better way than I think I would have had I tried to come up with it on my own. So you need to know what you, you already know, right? So it relates to this. Right? You've, already set, you've already decided what you know and how you know it, and that's helped you solidify some information. So now, as you're moving on to the next step, um, what do you already know, and what do you want to discover? So this first part, what do you already know, is about identifying information that makes the person that you're researching unique in all the world. Now, you may think that your person, you know, um, Zephaniah Scrub is the, like, nobody else could possibly have that name, and so his name alone makes him unique. Well, that's not necessarily true. And so you need to know inf enough information that you know that your person is unique in all the world. And then you need to talk about what you want to discover. So what we're doing here, and this is how we often put it with new people, go from what you know to the unknown. Go from the known to the unknown. That's what we're trying to do. What do you know? What do you want to discover? It's very frustrating to me as um, somebody who wants so much to help people. <laughs> when people come to me and say, um, I want to know, I want to find out who my great grandfather is. And they think that they're asking me a good question. And I'll say, okay, well, what, you know, what do you know about your great grandfather? Well, nothing. Okay, you can't go from knowing nothing to knowing something. You have to go from knowing something um, to discovering something new. So go from the known to the unknown. And so oftentimes after a little bit of prodding, I'll get some additional information out of them, right? Because the, it's not that they don't know anything about their great grandfather. It's that they haven't figured out what the unique information is. So if he's their great grandfather, presumably that means that he is the father of either a grandfather or a grandmother. Oh, okay, well he's he's my grandfather's father. Oh, okay, well what do you know about your grandfather? Oh, well my grandfather was born in Tennessee in 1904. Okay, so your grandfather was born in Tennessee in 1904. Do you know his father's name? No. Okay, do you know his mother's name? No. Okay, so what you're trying to discover is not tell me everything about your, my great-grandfather. What you want to discover is who are the parents of my grandfather? Right? Do you, do you, can you, hopefully you'll start to understand or see or feel the subtle difference between um, I need to know about my great-grandfather to who are the parents of my grandfather, right? Because the idea is we want to move from what we know to what we don't know, to what we want to discover. 
You can't start with knowing nothing and trying to discover something. Let me give you, um, I will give you an example or actually a couple of examples from um, my own family history research, but I'm actually gonna give you homework today. <laughs> um, I've been doing homework all week, so I think that that's maybe fair. I want you to take this formula and see if it works with one of your own um, research problems, okay? And it doesn't matter whether you just got started and are trying to discover who your grandparents are, or if you are 10 generations up your tree and trying to find out more information about um, people from the 1700s. The formula works regardless of what kind of research you're doing. So remember, um, the first step uh, is to question everything. So what do you know? So in my case, I know that Daniel Shipman and Elizabeth Burleson had at least nine children. Um, and I won't list all nine children here for lack of space, but then in my notes, I have listed all nine of those children. And I have all nine of those children listed in um, my family tree. Now the next question is, how do I know that? Okay, so there are a lot of ways I know that. Again, for space, I've only put a few of them on here, but um, one of the ways I know that is that um, all nine of those children are named in the distribution of Daniel's property upon his death. So Daniel actually didn't write a will formally. Um, he did um, do a deathbed um, distribution of his property. He told people um, uh, when he was sick and dying what he wanted to have happen to his property and then those people went to the court and um, witnessed that this was exactly how he said he wanted to distribute his property. And all nine of his children, or at least nine, there are nine children named in, um, in that witness, okay? So that's one way in which I know that they had at least nine children. Now you'll notice I use this word at least, this phrase at least, because there are nine children listed in his um, probate papers. There could have been more children, right? And maybe that's a step in my research that I need to take is were there other children? Uh, another way in which I know that Daniel Shipman and Elizabeth Burlin Burleson had at least nine children is that three of those children have Daniel and Elizabeth listed as their parents on death records. So I'm able to link some of the children to the parents, and then I'm able to link several of the children to each other through property records and transactions of property that occurred in the years following Daniel's death. Now, the, like I said, these are only three of the reasons why I know that these this group of people are the children of Daniel Shipman and Elizabeth Burleson. Several of them migrated together, um, to a location several states away. Some of them are named as witnesses to uh, marriages for some of the other children. Lots of different connections in this family. Um, some of them are what we call direct evidence, where it just right out in the record that you're looking at, it states these people are siblings or these people are the children of these people. Some of it is um, indirect evidence where you follow um, who's selling property to whom and um, you know who shows up on tax lists in a different state at the same time. And, you know, lots of different information goes into putting all of this together. But basically, this is what I know. I know that they had at least nine children and here's how I know it. So I'm working with what I feel like is some pretty solid information. Now, there are a million directions I could probably go with this research, right? I, I mentioned this at least thing, like I, I could want to know if they had more children. I could try to figure out the order of the children. I could try to figure out um, when and where the children were born. I, I mean, there's a million things that I hopefully will do, um, but I'm gonna just focus on one just to help you understand a little bit about this next step, right? So the first step is question everything, which I've gone through the process of questioning the information that I'm working with as a foundation, and now, I'm gonna ask good research questions. So good research question means I need to figure out what I already know. So in this case, I know that Sarah Shipman was one of the daughters of Daniel Shipman and Elizabeth Burleson. That's what I know based on the questioning that I did on the last screen, right? So then what do I want to discover? So I'm moving from something I know to something I want to know. And um, I'm actually going to share with you just, again, a little subtle thing that I think makes a big difference. Um, one, of the, one of the things I might want to discover about Sarah is, what is Sarah's birth date? 
That's a perfectly valid question. However, in family history, that might not be an entirely effective question. In order for it to be um, a more effective question, we need to think about um, whether or not it's even possible to answer that question. Again, I got this idea from Dr. Jones, and um, it was something that I think I had thought about before, but just never been able to articulate in quite the way that he was able to. The idea is that there are, we need to accept the fact that there are times and places where we will not have precision. That does not mean we won't have accuracy, okay? And here's what I mean by that. When was Sarah born is a more effective question than what is Sarah's birth date. Because when was Sarah born is an answerable question in almost every single case we might encounter. What is Sarah's birth date might not be answerable, okay? People, um, those of you who are new to family history may not know that birth certificates are a fairly new phenomenon, right? Like not everybody has a birth certificate. Not everybody even born in the 1900s has a birth certificate. And we're talking about somebody who was born in the 1700s, right? And so, um, so a birth date, narrowing down a birth date specifically, and by that I mean day, month, and year, might be impossible, right? There may be no record anywhere ever in Sarah's entire life that gives her birth date. But there will be records and clues, um, there will be evidence along the way that might tell us how old Sarah was when certain events in her life occurred. How old was she when she got married? How old was she when her first child was born? How old was she when she died? right? Lots of clues in her life that will lead us to when she was born. And the best answer we may end up with in our family tree is, you know, about 1794 um, or whatever the date happens to be, okay? So that's what I mean by less effective and more effective questions. What is Sarah's birth date is a good question, and it's a very specific question that's going to lead you to get it to search for information, but when was Sarah born is a more effective question because it is, in almost every instance, going to be answerable, whereas this one will not be. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, come over to the Facebook group, ask a question about it. I'm happy to answer that. Okay, um, let me give you one more example from the life of Sarah Shipman um, before we wrap up. Again, what do I already know? Well, I already know that Sarah Shipman was the daughter of Daniel Shipman and Elizabeth Burleson. And hopefully now, based on the previous question, I've discovered when she was born. Okay, those two pieces of information make her unique in all the world, right? Um, her name, her, her birth, her, when she was born, and her parentage, right? Okay, and that's important because she may not be the only Sarah Shipman in the world. She may not even be the only Sarah Shipman in the world who was born about the time and place that she was born. But you put all three of those pieces of information together and that makes her unique. And that's important because if we want to, um, so we've established this identity for her, that's important because if we want to connect her with anybody else, we need to make sure we're connecting the right Sarah Shipman to a husband and to children, um, to siblings, right? So the more uniquely identifying information you can collect about a person, the better. So maybe the next step, now, now that we've discovered um, when Sarah was born, maybe the next step is to discover information about what happened to Sarah, right? We know she was born in this time and in this place to this family, but then she grew up and what happened to her? So a less effective question might be, who was Sarah Shipman's husband? A more effective question might be, um, who was Sarah Shipman married to? Now again, subtle difference, but the subtle difference sometimes makes all the difference, okay? Here's why. Who was Sarah Shipman's husband is a question that assumes some things. First of all, it assumes that Sarah was married. Maybe she never married, right? Um, and that's an important um, 
idea to, to understand, right? You don't want to have a preconceived notion in your head that you have to find a husband for Sarah because there may not be one, <laughs> okay? It also, just by the nature of the way that that question is worded, um, puts forth this preconceived notion that she was only married once. Who was Sarah Shipman's husband? Oh, I found her husband. I'm done. No. What if she was married multiple times? Okay. You know, married, maybe she married young and her husband died and then she married again and, you know, that husband abandoned her and then she married again, right? So, so asking the question, who is Sarah Shipman's husband is a good research question, but a more effective one is who was um, Sarah Shipman married to or to whom was Sarah Shipman married, if you want to be grammatically correct. <laughs> um, and and that is, is a question that is a little bit more um, leading. It's a little bit more open-ended. It's a little bit more, it allows you to, to go where the, the evidence leads you rather than having these ideas that limit you and limit your research. Okay, like I said, two, just two brief examples from my own um, research about um, this process that I go through. And like I said, sometimes I do it super formally. Um, I end up writing notes and notes and notes. And sometimes I um, do it a little bit more informally, but I'm always going through this process in my head at the very least. What do I know? How do I know it? Because if I've got a brick wall in my family tree and I can't get past it, usually it's because I haven't answered this how do I know it question well enough. Um, or, you know, I've, I've made some incorrect conclusions that need to be revisited. So question everything. Question grandma. She didn't lie. <laughs> she just may have been given incorrect or inaccurate information. Um, she may have been working from her own preconceived notions. Okay. So question everything. What do you know? How do you know it? Then as you start to grow your family tree and add information to your tree, and I'm talking about not just adding people to your tree, but adding information about when and where they were born and when and where they were married and who they married and who their children were and when and where they died. Any information you add to your tree um, needs to come from a solid foundation of good research questions so that you make sure that you are um, collecting the accurate information and climbing your own family tree, okay? And so good research questions come from something you know to something you want to discover, right? You go from the known to the unknown. You can't go from the unknown to the unknown. <laughs> um, and I, I shared an example with you earlier. Hopefully that was useful. Well, that is all I have prepared for you today, and we're out of time, so that worked out well. Um, hopefully that all makes sense. Uh, you might need to watch this a time or two or jot down those questions, and like I said, do some homework. Try them out in, in your own tree with one of your own research challenges and see if asking those questions and answering those questions as you go doesn't improve the way that you're doing your research. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this is pre-recorded um, because I am still at the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy this week. So if you um, are watching this live, I will not be on chat immediately following the presentation today. However, feel free to leave comments on YouTube if you're watching this on our YouTube channel or come on over to the Ancestry.com Facebook page or Facebook group and ask your own questions. Um, if you want to clarify anything we've talked about today, if you want to start a discussion with other members of the genealogy community, I will sneak peeks at my laptop today um, to see if any of you are talking about this and um, need any clarification of anything I've talked about today. So um, make sure you stay away from those preconceived notions, and I know that you will be climbing your own family tree in no time and less likely to um, make some of those errors that we all made when we were new and getting started. Um, and I think it'll be a lot more fun for you too because it, it becomes almost like a little bit like detective work or, you know, as we start to chase down the family tree instead of just, um, you know, clicking and attaching things, we're actually thinking about it and following the clues. And we're, like I said, we're more likely to, to be climbing the right tree that way. So until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.